I can looks, get this presentation going here. Looks perfect. Okay, so what I was asked to talk about was the status of our pollinators, and I, I'm sure you meant bees, so I'm going to put in parentheses bees in Virginia. Uh, it's something that's been a, a topic of conversation for a lot of people for a number of years. Um, I, I was lucky enough to get into beekeeping back in the 1980s. Um, part of my uh, graduate career or studies included um, uh, beekeeping and went on from there to um, work with the, the uh, research and extension um, that was going on at Virginia Tech for a number of years uh, regarding the um, beekeeping uh, apiculture program. Um, that basically should let you know that I was, I was uh, uh, pre-mites, uh, PM, if you will, as far as my beekeeping experience. I've been through the, the best of times and the worst of times with the beekeeping. So it is something that, that um, I like to, to look at the bees or, or to explain to people the bees, the, about the bees being their, their um, canary in the mine, uh, that it has been a, at the forefront of what's happening to our pollinators, what's happening to our environment. Um, it is something that has been a major concern for not only um, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Extension, um, General Assembly, the governor, um, but also, you know, the, the people that work most closely with the bees, which are the beekeepers. So let's, let's get into the, into what a pollinator is. And basically the, um, the definition is, it's an agent such as an insect that pollinates flowers. And, and uh, if anyone's seen my uh, pollinator presentation to garden clubs, and I got to, um, got to visit with one on Friday and um, explain to them that the that the thing that makes a pollinator a pollinator is hair and so it's it's something that the that that the pollen can attach to um, it's designed to attach to it it's it's a pretty sticky substance not nearly as much as uh, much as the uh, as honey is as my wife will attest to because I spilt some in the floor the other day and we're still sticking to the kitchen floor a bit um, but pretty much anything's got hair, anything's got fibers that, that the pollen can attach to, um, that becomes a pollinator. And for animals, uh, of course, that, it, that includes the vertebrates, the bees, the, uh, the uh, excuse me, the, the bats, the birds, the bears, and even ourselves as we're walking through, the, um, through a meadow or um, other locations and picking up uh, pollen on our shoes, on our pants, and on the hairs on our hands and arms and carrying it off to the next flower. Um, I explained to people, I said, we're, we're pollinators, we're just very inefficient pollinators, because we don't have a reason for becoming in contact with the flowers other than to, um, you know, smell the flowers, smell the, um, the, the fragrance of the flowers and, and enjoy the colors. Um, the invertebrates are much more uh, efficient at the, um, at being pollinators in that they are utilizing the plants at, not only as a food source for some of them, such as the, the beetles and, and uh, uh, some of our wasps and so forth, but also as a food source um, in the fact that they are um, using the nectar, using the pollen. And those primarily are the, are the bees and our lepidoptera. Um, or butterflies or moths and so forth. And so the bees are the ones that most commonly come to mind to people. They're the most efficient, most effective um, as far as being able to, um, to do that pollination. And just to enlighten you, I'm not just talking about honeybees. Um, there's over 20,000 known bee species in the world, 4,000 in the United States, more than 500 in Virginia. Um, so there's, there's lots of different species of bees that are around that, that do that pollination. Um, some are available for most of the year. Um, some are available for all of the year. Well, I should say one is available for all of the year. And then uh, the vast majority of them are only available for about six to eight weeks out of the adult um, lifespan, life period of their uh, development that allows them to go out and searching for nectar, searching for pollen. Um, coming back and fortifying a nest, um, typically in, in, the, in the ground or in a hollow um, a burrow tree hole and, and allows them to, um, to reproduce and grow the next generation that will occur roughly tw uh, 11 months later um, to start the whole process all over again. 
if we look at the at the families um, taxonomically of, of the bee species that that are in the United States in Virginia, um, there are seven known, or I should say, there are seven species that are out there. Again, most of these are are um, uh, you know solitary bees. They're ground nesters. <clears throat> we don't see them very often. Um, but the family Apidae, which the honeybee is in, um, those are the are more social insects. Those that are going to be occurring uh, either either sharing in a, a community, uh, trying to uh, help out each other as far as the resources, like in the digger bees, um, orchard bees. You see them uh, very often nesting in a in a community as opposed to um, being being truly solitary and, and away from all the other uh, species. But we also have the social, um, truly social um, honey or uh, bees in that in that we see with the honeybees and the bumblebees where there's a division of labor, there's a, a division of, of uh, reproductive activities. And so each individual in the, inside of the colony has a, a purpose and a duty um, a job to do, much like we see in our own society, where uh, we separate out individuals into various careers and jobs to fulfill what the what society needs. Um, within those families, uh, within Apidae, uh, there are seven genus um, and 118 different bee species that are known in Virginia. Um, this is the, you know, it gives you an idea of the variety of of pollinators that we have out there that uh, interact with each other, interact with nature, interact with the plants, but have a, a, a very diverse um, life cycle. They have a very diverse life history um, that allows them to do what they do and to keep the you know plants being pollinated, not just their agricultural crops, but um, mostly our environmental crops, the ones that we see in the forest and the, in the meadows and in the, and in the wetlands that um, allow the, the uh, stability of our environment. But again, there's only one managed bee species in Virginia. Um, we talk about orchard bees and other bees that uh, alfalfa bees that um, are <clears throat> managed, and it's not truly managed. It's more like having like the bee havers of the old that um, would put out a a skep or a gum and uh, or collect a a uh, swarm and throw in a box. And the next year, they kill them off in order to. Um, collect the honey that's in there and start all over again with another swarm. It's not really managing as much as just having. Um, and so with the with these orchard bees and, and others, we're providing a nesting site, but we're not really managing their life cycle, not really managing uh, their needs and promoting their uh, colony production, their, their, their um, population increases in, in dealing with environmental stresses like we do with the, with the honeybee. So the advantage of having the honeybee, of course, is that it is mobile. Um, as many of you know, it can fly on average two miles in every direction, covering 12 square miles. And of course, it, um, it, it will go only as far as it needs to, um, but go as far as it has to. Uh, which means that if there's a patch of clover or um, apple trees or whatever right outside the door, they're not going to fly two miles away. Um, but if there's nothing within that two mile radius, um, they're going to head out even further until they find what they need in order to bring back the, the uh, food, the supplies that they need. Now, ideally, um, with regard to agriculture, um, they're not going to have to fly that two miles. Like I said, they're going to be on like the orchard. They're going to find the, the food source, the pollen source, the nectar source right outside the door. And so for pollination in Virginia, uh, we look at, at what, not just what the bees manufacture within the hive for themselves and for us, we look at what it manufactures for us outside of the hive. And that pollination that, that just the honeybees that, that contribute to the uh, agricultural products, the quality, the quantity, the value of those agricultural crops in Virginia. Um, we're looking at over $135 million um, as far as their value. That's a, that's a tremendous amount of, of money, of revenue that comes into the farmer's hands um, and can be passed on to the, the rest of the, of the state um, as far as, as revenues. Um, but if we look at the at the value of honey in comparison, um, what you are, are manufacturing or what you are producing and bottling, selling, um, typically we're only making a million dollars a year off of that honey. 
So we're, we're basically uh, through that pollination, through the pollination efforts of the honeybee, um, they're increasing the value 135 times over what the, what we think traditionally is the value of the honey, honeybee is, and that's the honey. Um, so as, as many school kid has heard me say, uh, the honeybee is misnamed. It's a misnomer in that, that we call it the honeybee. It should be the, the pollen tree, uh, pollen bee, that, that it goes out and does all of this work for us to, to uh, produce uh, the foods that we need. Now, that said, as a, the honeybee is air canary in the mine. It has been going through some very difficult times of late, um, actually over 25 years now, uh, pushing on to 30 um, since we've been having problems with it. Uh, it's not a new occurrence as some people would, would, would assume that you know, within the past 10 years, it's been an issue. It's been going on for a number of years now. Um, that our populations of honeybees, it's been a struggle to maintain them. It's been a struggle to carry them over from one season to the next, one, one year to the next. Um, it's getting harder and harder to get them through the summer now. And so what's going on with the honeybees is, is also being seen in other pollinators. And so to, just to take a look at, at some of those, um, what's happening in, a, in those other pollinators. Um, if, if there are other people out there with pretty gray hair, um, similar to myself, and, and have been around for a while, um, you may remember a, a broadcast by the name of Paul Harvey. He had a, a broadcast, a daily broadcast um, back in the 70s, 80s, or it may have been even into the 90s, called The Rest of the Story. And he would take a, a known story, a, a very, very um, familiar story, and really give you the, the nitty details of something, something that you wouldn't have heard in the local press or heard reported in the, in the TV news. He would give you this kind of the behind the scenes um, information about, about the story. Um, you know, I, I um, uh, enjoyed listening to him and, and, and hearing those, those details that made the story even more fascinating. So I mean, he was really actually a fascinating man. If, if any of you, um, like I said, if you remember him, he used to, there, there was a story that he um, only watched TV while he was on his exercise bike. Um, that he had rigged up or had rigged up his exercise bike with a generator so that it was tied in with the TV. So he had to exercise in order to watch TV. So really fascinating man. And, and uh, it, like I said, had, had some great stories. But that said, there is the rest of the story to a lot of the um, things that are going on in our insect world uh, with their pollinators. Um, first off, we look at the, at the monarch butterfly. Um, since the 1980s, as you can see, there's actually two populations that we monitor, well, three technically, but really two that people uh, watch over. Uh, it's the eastern and western populations of the monarch butterfly, which fly up basically up the coast up north and then come back down into Mexico and over, or down into the southern states and over winter, depending on the west or the east population. The western population since the 1980s has declined by 99%. Uh, for 4.5 million to roughly 1,900 monarchs. Um, this year, they were saying that, you know, the population looked like it re re rebounded and was getting more numbers. And then they, um, similar to what we experienced just a few, um, I guess it was just last week, um, you know, a, a cold front came through and, and uh, the numbers dropped dramatically. So they're revising their, their numbers. And, but the end result is that we're seeing a lot less monarch butterflies in the western population and in the eastern population which hasn't declined quite as much but um, still has has declined uh, you know a significant amount 88 um, percent over the past um, 40 years um, so it it is something that uh, fish and wildlife service uh, you know we, we see a lot of attention in the news um, each year we see the monarch watch going on to see what the populations are like. And, and so this is something that's grabbed attention to a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the individuals out there as far as how the monarchs are, are being treated and how that population is, is, has been interacting uh, in, in responding to the environmental cues. Recently, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned, and by recently, I mean a few years ago, actually, the Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned to um, include the monarch butterfly on the 
uh, on the endangered species list. And they just concluded their review of that and, and decided that yes, it warranted being listed as, an, as a uh, threatened species, but there are more and uh, higher priority uh, listing actions that need to go forward with other species um, before the monarch butterfly goes forward. And I, I, I point that out because at, just shortly after that, this past year, um, the Fish and Wildlife came out with its list of, of recommendations for various species. Some of them was to list different species and so forth, but the, the most startling and, and troubling part of it was that they are delisting 23 species due to extinction of the species. That's never been, never happened before. Um, yes, we've had uh, it, it, various species being delisted because of extinction, but not 23 at a time. Usually it's one or two or it's, you know, years between. And so we're seeing a, an increase in that extinction route of many of our species. Um, and, and, it, and it is a, a concern that, um, you know, that, that Fish and Wildlife and the Commonwealth of Virginia ha has expressed. Um, when I was hired as the, endangered, or the uh, ap state apiarist, um, the other part of my job, or one of the other parts of my job, uh, was to serve as the endangered plant and insect species coordinator. So the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is the regulatory authority for the Endangered Plant and Insect Species Act. Uh, where the Department of Wildlife Resources, which used to be the Department of Game Land and Fisheries, deals with uh, other wildlife, uh, the uh, wildlife and, and uh, vertebrates and invertebrates um, that uh, would be listed as endangered or threatened. Um, so we get the insects, we get the plants. Um, and in 2000, when I came on, there were 15 species that were listed under the Endangered Plant and Insect Species Act, um, 14 endangered and one threatened species and there were no insects. In the past 20 years, um, that list has, has risen to 44 species listing, 26 endangered, 18 threatened, and nine of those are insects. Um, so you can see that we've taken a kind of an about face in our uh, response to um, listing of the endangered species and that we're seeing a, a, uh, uh, a very determined uh, uh, effort to uh, protect their, their natural resources, and in particular insects, which, like I said, in, in 2000, which is probably why they brought an entomologist on as the Endangered Plant and Insect Species Coordinator, um, to bring in the insects so that we could um, include those in that, in that protection. <laughs> Back in 2013, um, an event made national, international news um, in that uh, a, a parking lot uh, was sprayed. Uh, the linden trees that were, that were in the parking lot were sprayed for um, uh, pest species. And in so doing, they did it during the bloom of the linden tree. Um, they managed to kill over 50,000 bumblebees at the same time. It was the, it was the largest recorded kill of, of uh, bumblebees at the time. And if you look on the, on the bottom right corner, um, you can see what one of the responses they had um, was to basically put a netting over top of the uh, linden trees that were still in bloom, still bumblebees were coming in from the fields across the street from the parking lot. Uh, to the blooms, to the blossoms, and uh, were taken in the in in the pesticide, and were um, dying as you know people were trying to you know find out what was going on. And so they put all this netting in the company, the manufacturer of the pesticide, put netting over all of these trees to protect them. Um, the rest of the story, the pesticide company that sprayed the uh, Wilsonville, Oregon trees, two weeks later. In the middle of all of this uproar, internet, like I said, national, international news of the loss of these of these bees, efforts by the Depart Oregon Department of Agriculture, the man pesticide manufacturer, to protect the bumblebees from further exposure to the pesticide, that same pesticide applicator went about 20 miles down the road and sprayed another parking lot full of linden trees and started killing off more bumblebees, and so we started seeing um, in two sites total disregard for what the law, what the label said, and that you needed to not spray when pollinators or bees are present, um, and not to, um, you know, not to put it on there when the, when the bloom is occurring. And so as a result of that, 
in these two applications, there were tens of thousands of bumblebees that were killed off um, and, and really put a, uh, a, a very serious concern in pollination of the, of the resources that were there um, for, the, for many years to come. And it's not just the bumblebees that were out there. Um, if we look at what's going on in our bumblebee population, <clears throat> these are the um, species, uh, the genus Bombus. Um, some of these are Eastern uh, bumblebees. You can see the, uh, the in the uh, 1999 to, or 1900 to 1999 is the blue, um, are the blue bars here. Uh, the red bars are from 2007 to 2009, monitoring the populations of them. Some of these did very well in patient, um, so forth, uh, look like they rebounded, but most of the populations, particularly the Aphenis, the Pennsylvanicus, and the Terracola. Now, this is the yellow banded bumblebee, this is the American bumblebee, and this is the um, rusty patch bumblebee. Um, if you're familiar with the rusty patch bumblebee, you know that it was put on the endangered species list just a few years ago. Um, and it has been um, a source of concern in many of the uh, um, developments, or not developments, but in, in many of the um, uh, um, pipelines uh, that have been going through and the power lines that have been going through in that as the companies were looking to build through the mountains of uh, the Blue Ridge and in the uh, western part of, of Virginia, um, biologists were going ahead of the of the um, of the the lane of the of the pipeline to survey for Bombus affinis, and they were running into them, and so it was a major reason for uh, the Atlantic pipeline being shut down, and then the um, uh, and, and others um, have been slowed down and possibly stopped as well. Um, the Terracola, the yellow band or the yellow uh, banded bumblebee, is going to be probably is going to be listed shortly. Um, it's on the uh, a, a, um, along with the monarch butterfly and others. It is on the list of those that have been petitioned for listing, and, and most of the evidence would indicate that it's going to be listed listed soon. Same thing with the Pennsylvanicus. Um, you know, these are bumblebees that were be that were prevalent back in the 1990s, as you can see. Um, the Bombus affinis was probably the number one pollinator of pumpkins. Um, there was there was a study uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania did uh, back in the uh, 1990s, and they found that the Bombus affinis was the was the primary pollinator of of pumpkins up in the up in Pennsylvania. Um, and now they're on the endangered species list. So there's lots of things that, that we're seeing that are occurring, not just in our honeybees, as I said, but in the other bees as well, and our other pollinators. With regard to our honeybees, <clears throat> you know, we've heard, we hear a lot, we continue to hear people talk about the colony collapse disorder. Um, it was first reported uh, in 2006. Uh, it was um, uh, a, a gentleman uh, up uh, Pennsylvania, uh, apiculturist or ap apiarist um, that was, um, ha was overwintering in Florida, um, found that 90% of his colonies had di basically just disappeared. Um, and so that brought attention to, the, to what was going on uh, in not only in his colonies, but also the other uh, beekeepers around, they started reporting very similar things in their commercial operations. Um, there was award-winning film, Vanishing of the Bees, that came out in 2007. And of course, in 2008, um, you know, the, the, we started seeing uh, the, the national um, colony loss uh, survey being uh, initiated by the uh, Bee Informed Partnership, or actually by the USDA at the time, and it's been picked up by the Bee Informed Partnership. Um, that one is, if you aren't aware of it, that's uh, a survey that goes on each year and uh, started up, it starts in April 1 and goes through April 30th. So if you haven't participated in the past and, uh, or you don't, uh, uh, aren't aware of the, uh, you know, when it starts, it is going on now. So you just go to Be Informed Partnership and the, you can see the, uh, the link there for the Colony Loss and Management Survey. Um, so I encourage all of you to participate in that, um, get, at, get some information out there for us to understand what's going on in our hives, what management might be beneficial to overcome things like, um, you know, it, 
issues that we that we attributed to the colony collapse disorder. Um, it should be noted, <clears throat> colony collapse disorder is not a disease. It's a function of, of uh, diseases, pest management practices, pests, um, all kinds of different things that, that go on. So it is um, at, at best guess, uh, um, it is several disorders, um, several diseases that occur, nosema, um, Israeli acute paralysis vir virus was uh, early on was identified as the main um, identifiers of when colony collapse disorder occurs. But basically, it is just your, your bees just literally just dwindle away to nothing. Um, that picture in the top right corner, you can see where there's still brood there, the queen has been active, um, but the bees have just disappeared, um, have dwindled away to nothing. Uh, usually happens over just a short period of time of a few weeks. Um, beekeeper will be out in his hives and say, you know, everything's everything looks good. Everything is um, moving forward. Come back in two or three weeks and the bees are gone from the hive. And it's just no no rhyme or reason, nothing there to test um, to see what, uh, what caused it. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that, that, um, that I have brought out with the rest of the story with regard to um, what's, what's going on with their bees is that this isn't a new occurrence. You know, we, we look at the 2006 um, incident that led to uh, or plight of the beekeepers in Virginia and later the uh, beehive distribution program that brought attention to the uh, of our legislators to the what's going on with their bee populations and need for pollinators. Um, but it is something that that occurred, you know, years before, um, you know, Hackenberg um, reported losing his his bees. And that's something that um, you know, we had been tracking for many years, you know, back in the 1960s in Virginia, we probably had 100,000 hives easily or more um, managed in, the, in, the, in Virginia, in the Commonwealth. Um, it was a thriving industry. In the 1970s, when I was, you know, still in high school, uh, middle school, then, you know, you could not walk outside without encountering a bee in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, it was just, they were just everywhere. Um, you know, we, we hear the, the um, uh, complaint from environmentalists that the honeybee is causing the demise of the bumblebee, it's causing the demise of the monarch butterfly because it's, it's taken away, it's out competing these other pollinators for the food resources that we have. In actuality, they've been, you know, they're actually in smaller numbers, significantly smaller numbers now than they were 40 years ago. Uh, when all of these other species were thriving. And so to blame the, the, the honeybee uh, for the demise of these other pollinators just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but it is still something that usually ranks number one on the list of why, um, you know, what's happening with these other, other pollinator po populations. But if we look at the chart here, you can see that the decline of the populations have been going on. Some of this is more related to a change from an agrarian to a, um, uh, you know, industrialized society. Uh, we're seeing more and more people, and I'll, I'll mention this later on in the, in the talk, seeing more and more people moving away from the farm and into the cities. Um, it's kind of leveled out in the 1970s and so forth, but once the trachomite came in and later the boromite came in, you see that we had this tremendous drop in the numbers of, of colonies that we had, of populations of honeybees in the, in the United States. And it seems like about every five years, we see something new coming into the, into the United States. You know, first it was the trachomite. It was, the, you know, before that, it, I mean, after that, it was the boromite. Um, then we had the small high beetle. Then we had the Israeli acute paralysis virus. And we got Nosema serrana and on and on and on. So um, we've got um, roughly about every five years, we're seeing something new come into the United States that, um, uh, that negatively affects the honeybee population. And that's something that, that um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably going to continue um, because of the international trade that we see. Uh, we are now seeing an importation of honeybees from other countries. Uh, New Zealand was recently approved to uh, begin again shipping bees from their country to the, um, to the United States, uh, primarily for the almond pollination. Um, other countries have, have filed suit for, um, or I should say, filed the paperwork 
for bringing bees into the United States. And so um, we've got the uh, USDA APHIS, the uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has um, received uh, requests from European countries, from South American countries, from Asian countries uh, to, to ship bees over here. Um, and so we're going to probably see more countries, more bees being shipped in. Uh, at one time, we had protection um, from the shipment of, of uh, bees and germplasm for into the United States uh, through a law, a federal law back in the 1920s. But uh, the World Court has basically ruled that that's, you know, is, is for lack of a better term, unconstitutional. Um, so that, that now we have to have justification for keeping um, bees out. And one of those, of course, is that if, if another country has a pest or disease that we know we don't have, um, then we can continue to keep those, that country from shipping bees here. But if that country um, that is petitioning has um, you know, been, been monitoring their bees, knows what diseases, knows what pests there are in their country, and the same is here, um, then USDA is going to be um, reviewing it and, and possibly approving the introduction of bees um, from that from that country. <clears throat> that said, you know the one you know the long and short of that is that um, we are going to continue to see things being introduced accidentally. Um, you know that's that where we are, that's what we assume occurred with the trachea mite, with the varroa mite, with the small high beetle was that they just kind of hitched a ride on a, you know, a, a, um, a, a cargo ship or some other, uh, you know, source of, of uh, introduction, uh, similar to the, what the Asian giant hornet did as far as coming into Vancouver and in, in, uh, northwestern Washington. Um, you know, we're seeing an introduction of pests, we're seeing an introduction of diseases, not just for the honeybee, for, but for all of our um, plants and animals, so forth, that, that uh, uh, that are occurring almost on a daily, um, usually weekly basis coming into our ports and to our, um, through international trade. <clears throat> Getting back to the rest of the story. Um, this is directly related to um, what, you know, beekeepers are seeing. So back in uh, 2016, <clears throat> in Somerville, South Carolina, there was a huge bee kill. Um, there had been a hurricane that had come through the local uh, health uh, organizations determined that the mosquito population with the Zika virus was uh, was escalating, and that they needed to control the um, the mosquito population. So they went out and they sprayed an area. Um, unfortunately, there were um, uh, bees in that area, and as a result, they saw a huge kill off of of, uh, of honeybees, uh, managed bees, um, in that that um, uh, Somerville area. Um, you know, it it caught my attention, not just because of the loss of the bees and the, and the enormous numbers, it was because my daughter, oldest daughter, lives very close to Somerville, South Carolina. So I was familiar with the area, uh, familiar with, the, with some of the beekeeping operations that were going on down there and, and, and the efforts and the pride that they had in the low country of, of, uh, of their, their beekeeping, the honey they produce and so forth. And so this was something that, that was more or less um, hit home, hit per, it was personal to me. Um, the rest of the story was that <clears throat> the individual that, the, the, um, that saw the most loss, um, there are indications that uh, she did, may not have had such a large loss, except for the fact that she euthanized many of the, um, the colonies once they were sprayed with pesticides. Uh, I think her interpretation was that she did not want to see them suffer. Um, she didn't want to see the pesticides um, linger inside of the hives and see the um, and struggle with them to get them through the winter, um, but those were things that weren't reported um, to the uh, local media that weren't reported to the or through the local media that that uh, maybe the losses needn't have been quite as bad um, if she had um, taken uh, proper precautions uh, because the local authorities did announce um, that they were going to be spraying uh, that they were going to be. Uh, you know, in certain areas. Um, unfortunately, because of the weather, um, they were not able to, to, uh, con to stick with the schedule that they had put out. Um, although they had warned that if the winds were too high, or if it was too wet, or, you know, any other adverse conditions that that would uh, countermand uh, the, the effectiveness of the, of the pesticide, that they would delay it. 
Um, and this is evidently the beekeepers that were down there f missed that point. Um, and so the bees were exposed to a lot more pesticide than they had, uh, than, than the applicators had anticipated. Another issue that has come up um, this past year, we saw um, in Glasgow, a number of world leaders come together, scientists, uh, environmentalists um, come together and talk about at the COP26 to talk about the, um, the state of, um, of the environment, uh, what we could do to address um, climate change and a number of other, other issues. Um, uh, they came out with uh, many of the Nobel laureates, scientists and activists, uh, signed a letter um, <clears throat> that basically stated that, that uh, uh, they wanted to stop the, the animal agriculture and shift to a plant-based agriculture so that it would save the environment. And, and their, their interpretation was that by doing away with the plants, we do, or excuse me, doing away with the animal agriculture, we do away with the methane gas, we do away with a lot of the, um, uh, uh, you know, mass production um, issues that we see as far as using the animal base. What they ignored was the fact that the plant-based system requires more energy input and land in, than the animal base system does, uh, where the animal base would be uh, more or less grazing on, on what's there would be, uh, yes, we do see the monoculture as far as the uh, corns and, and uh, soy and, and other uh, things that are grown just for that, their consumption. Um, <clears throat> that's not to say that we would need the same land in order to produce the, the vegetables and other plants, other you know, grasses, grains, and so forth in order to feed humans. <clears throat> so there's, there was this, this disconnect uh, between what plant agriculture is versus animal agriculture. Um, and, and that the, the, um, the people that signed this letter um, you know, needed to take a look and see what was the you know, what would the potential impact of having a solely plant-based um, uh, production? Uh, primarily, if we're taking away forests, a three-dimensional, um, you know, green uh, landscape to going back to a more two-dimensional, um, you know, with production of vegetables and, and other plants uh, for consumption, then, then it would take up a lot more food or a lot more land. It would take a lot more uh, need for fertilizer, for pesticide to control, um, you know, outbreak of pests and so forth, and use of water, um, which would drain aquifers even faster than what uh, we'd see with the animal base. And th those are things that, that, you know, if we look at, at uh, some of the uh, Arab countries that were taking, uh, you know, waters out of their aquifers in order to produce food for their country um, in, a, in an arid environment, um, they basically drain the aquifers under their under their countries in order to uh, produce those, those plants in a very short amount of time. So we're seeing very similar things going on in Texas, um, where it's not just the just the uh, plant production, it's also the, um, you know, human numbers um, that are that are draining those aquifers. And those are things that we need to need to be aware of when we start thinking about changing our resources from an animal agriculture to a plant based agriculture. Now, many of you have probably heard um, the, the um, statements that, that about what, you know, what will happen if the honeybees disappeared. Um, and so we, we have a number of theories. Uh, we have a number of, of, of questions as to what will happen if we see the uh, honeybees disappeared. E.O. Wilson was an entomologist that recently passed away. Um, but he was uh, wrote very uh, a number of uh, very significant books, uh, very very telling books, and in his writings he says that if insects were to vanish, um, so would nearly all flowering plants. Uh, that pollination effort, the reproduction of the plants, would disappear, and the food webs that they support would disappear. Uh, this loss in, in turn would cause the extinction of reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, including ourselves, and in effect nearly all the terrestrial life because the food resources, the, the habitats, the, um, you know, the, the, the um, production of, of oxygen and so forth would all disappear along with us. 
And so the disappearance of insects would, would be almost a rapid uh, into the decomposition of organic materials. We think of beetles. Um, they, are, they are very active and flies are very active in, in, uh, in, in decomp decomposition of that organic material, particularly the animal, um, but as, as well as the plant, um, dead uh, you know, plants that have died back in the, in the fall, in the wintertime. So these are things that, that you know, we need to be aware of when we think about how important their insects are. Um, you know, I mentioned before about how important their, their honeybees are to pollination of their crops in Virginia. Um, but it goes beyond that in, that in that they don't just do that pollinate insects, don't just do that pollination. They also uh, allow us to maintain a stable and in, in, uh, in, in productive environment. <clears throat> and recently in the New York Times, um, we, see, we saw an article that talked about the insect Armageddon, uh, the global insect die-off um, that has, um, uh, you know, will, will be responsible for, um, you know, loss of pollination of over of roughly 75% of all flowering plants. Um, and so with that Armageddon that we're seeing, you know, as I touched on the monarch butterfly, the situation, the, uh, the bombus of Venice, the honeybees themselves, um, that drop off in the population, those are things that will be directly related to that pollination, that reproduction of plants that will occur as we see the loss of those insects. And so there's a lot of things that go into what this insect Armageddon is and what, it, what, uh, you know, what impact it's going to have on the rest of the, uh, on us in particular. Um, but, and there's been a lot of, of speculation as to what is the cause for it. Um, <clears throat> climate change, of course, has been very high on the list of what uh, people are, are concerned of. Um, changes in temperatures, changes in the, uh, uh, you know, CO2 levels, changes in all kinds of different um, uh, environmental factors that have led to higher temperatures, uh, wide fluctuations in, in, uh, uh, in, our, in our weather. Um, this is something that uh, I think people in the in the south, uh, southern, uh, eastern part of the United States are, are experiencing over the past few weeks with the thunderstorms and tornadoes that have been coming through. Um, it's being attributed to the uh, to climate change, um, you know, increasing in the sea level uh, has been attributed to climate change. Lots of things have, have gone into that. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, the introduction of invasive spe pest species. Again, not just the honeybee with the trachea mite, the varroa mite, and the small high beetle, but um, we've got the Asian giant hornet. We've got uh, the gypsy moth, uh, well, which is now the spongy moth, excuse me. Uh, it's been changed um, to the, uh, from the, from that old determination or, or old common name to now being called the spongy moth. Um, we've got other uh, pest diseases, um, uh, bacterial, viral, uh, rust, and so forth that have been coming into the United States that have been, um, you know, either, like I said, either by accident uh, or in some cases intentional, um, as it was with the gypsy moth, that spongy moth uh, was intentionally brought over. Honeybees um, have been, as I said, have been referred to as an invasive species that was introduced to our, you know, air credit 400 years ago in Virginia in 1622. Um, and then of course, we've got diseases that are being introduced, as like I said, um, genetic diversity is declining. Uh, there's been a number of studies within the, within the honeybee populations um, that have shown that, that genetic diversity is declining, uh, mainly because um, uh, beekeepers, uh, like I said, back in the 1990s, when we were seeing that die off from the uh, varroa mite, the trachea mite, um, it cut back on the number of uh, producers of, of queens and bees to be sold throughout the United States. And so <clears throat> that led to a, a, a bottleneck, if you will, of, of resources. And so everybody was getting their bees from pretty much the same, same source. And so that, you know, as they go out and they um, cross with other bees that were, that did survive through the, that, that die back from the, um, from the varroa and the trachea mite, um, we didn't see as much diversity. Now, some of the things that you, you all are doing uh, with the production of nukes as opposed to reliance on, on package bees coming in or producing your own queens rather than bringing in queens from, from these um, commercial producers, um, that's helping to 
uh, the the population to or the honeybee population to rebound as far as that genetic diversity. Um, intensive farming, the monoculture, biotechnology that's being used, pesticides that are being used, um, all of those are having an adverse effect on their on their populations. Um, it, the monoculture in particular, um, what we're seeing is that the um, honeybees need a diverse food source. They need pollen, they need nectar from different plants in order to maintain the um, the, the, the proper nutrients, the proper nutrition that they need in their diet. Um, very similar to us, you know, we can't all live off of rice and, and water. Uh, we need other things, uh, you know, vegetables uh, to come in. We need fruits to come in uh, to provide us with, with vitamins, with nu nutrients that we uh, may not get from a single source. And our honeybees are the same way. So we need to have, you know, look to, to place our bees in a location that has um, different food sources, different plants in bloom, um, not just a single um, single flowering plant. Um, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation are other things that that uh, have been attributed to the uh, pollinator population decline. And and I'd like to address that right now because I think that is that is probably um, areas that have been mainly overlooked. Um, as far as the beekeepers are concerned, but definitely by our environmentalists that are looking for reasons for that pollinator decline. Um, <clears throat> you know, we look at we look at the diversity. Um, if we look at the at the picture down in the lower right corner there, um, that's a that's a, um, a picture that was taken from the uh, space station over time lapse. And so you can see all that light that's going on, and particularly in the eastern part of the United States and along the uh, west coast of, of where people are located. Um, you know, if we if we were to look further north there into Canada, you can see that it's a little darker um, than what it is down in down in the United States. So we know that that population is increasing. You know, we just went through a, uh, the 2020 census. <clears throat> And that we found out that the uh, Virginia increased its population by 8.4%. Um, but one of the things that you know was noted has been noted is that the in insect apocalypse. Um, the one thing that can be associated most definitively with that loss of our pollinators is the urbanization of our of our of their countryside. Um, you know, 78% of the lands is in private. So 85% of uh, land at Easter of Mississippi are privately owned. And, and those lands are being um, developed um, for commercial, sometimes for private use. Um, and so we're losing trees, we're losing landscape, you know, grass and concrete seems to be the, uh, the wave of the, of, the, of the current of the future and that we're losing 6,000 acres a day uh, to urbanization. And to put that in perspective, <clears throat> as I said, we just went through that census. Uh, what we saw was that the that Virginia has gone through a uh, an increase in the past ten years of eight point four percent. Now, eight point four percent of a thousand isn't that many, but eight point four percent of eight million is nearly three quarters of a million people um, that have been added to Virginia over the past um, ten years. Um, you can see how the population of Virginia. Um, has changed over the course of the of the census um, that's been taken. Uh, we had a few flat areas. Um, some of you are familiar with what happened in back in the 1860s, early 1860s. Um, one of those events was the fact that West Virginia seceded from Virginia. Um, that took um, roughly about a third of the uh, of the landmass and and probably about a fifth of the population just in the secession of the of West Virginia from Virginia. Um, <clears throat> other things, like I said, 1860, we had other things that were taking life as well. Um, along in here, 1940s, we're seeing, you know, the events of, of World War II. In the 1920s, we saw the, um, the loss of life to the uh, Spanish flu and so forth. So it kind of flattened out during those, those 10 to 20 years. Um, but once we got past World War II into the 1950s, uh, late 1940s into the 50s, it was just an exponential growth from there. We've, we've increased in growth by 222% um, since 1945. Um, so that's a huge uh, increase in the, in the population um, over that time period. Tie that in with what's been going on as far as the urbanization. Um, we are seeing, again, a, a, a move 
Now, and it didn't start, you know, uh, it, it hasn't been a recent event, but it is, has been ongoing very rapidly over the past 100, 150 years. Um, so once the industrial revolution started kicking in, uh, we started seeing people flocking more or less to the um, to the cities, to the urban, to the suburbs. Uh, back in the 1950s, the, the uh, U.S. government had to redefine what an urban environment was and then start looking at it as, as it's not just the urban areas, the cities, it's also those urban clusters like the um, communities and uh, that, that um, uh, you know, where people are coming together as a, as a, as a, like, again, as a community, as a cluster, uh, but not necessarily organizing as a city itself. And so right now we're looking at 75% of our population is, is, has been urbanized. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I, I, you know, being a Star Trek fan, I'm, I think of the, of the, um, uh, the episode in which uh, Captain Kirk beams down to the planet Gideon and, um, and they find out that they have done away with um, disease. They've done basically with death. They're living for, you know, hundreds of years. And so the population has just gone crazy on the planet. And so their personal space is about six inches. Um, and so we're, we seem to be moving in that direction you know, that, that people are losing space um, between and, and in doing that, they're filling it in with uh, roads to connect them, power lines uh, going in to keep their cell phones going, the computers running. Um, they're, we're putting in highways to get um, from place to place to move their goods um, into between their, their urban environments. Uh, we're having to put in, uh, you know, more and more housing. Um, and, and people are taking those, those forests. I mean, my, the neighborhood I'm in is, is a good example of that. Uh, when we first moved here in 2000, uh, we had a, 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 a very large forested area right across the highway from where we, from the development that we live in. Um, since that time, we've had um, two schools um, built. We've had um, uh, a, a shopping center, um, two retirement communities, um, numerous housing developments, um, churches, temples, all kinds of things that are taking away that forested area and turning it into, as I said, concrete and, and, uh, and asphalt. Um, but what's left behind, of course, anything green is more or less grass that people are, you know, using them more as to keep under control and, and treating with, with herbicides to keep the clover from coming in. So we're taking away that food resources that are that our pollinators need and replacing them with things that that we think uh, or that, that we need in order to survive at least in the short term so where are our beekeepers um, how are we related to that um, very similar in, in that urbanization and that we see uh, most of our beekeepers this is a map of the of the um, uh, the the uh, bee, bee check uh, program <coughs> And you can see that most of our uh, beekeepers are clustered together, just like in our urban environments, just like your, our populations are, uh, human populations are. Tidewater area, central Virginia, the Richmond, Petersburg area. Here you are up in northern Virginia. You can see we've got a massive um, numbers. And in fact, if you really follow these lines of clustering, here comes 95 in here, and there goes 64 over there. Here's 81 coming down the valley going out the side. So um, very little development, very little uh, urbanization down in the south side. Um, it's still primarily an agricultural environment. Um, but these are these central Virginia, Richmond, northern Virginia, uh, Tidewater areas are very rapidly turning into um, those urban centers of industrial and communication centers um, that people are, are, um, are flocking to. And to look at what our, what our winter losses are, I mentioned the winter loss survey. Um, back in 2000, I started uh, surveying our beekeeping clubs to see what the losses were. Um, 2010, that's when uh, Bee Informed uh, USDA uh, uh, annual survey started in. And so the uh, first few years we combined those. And then later on, um, we, primary, we were primarily looking at that uh, Bee Informed survey um, for getting our information on what our losses are. And, and um, to our Virginia beekeepers credit, uh, we are one of the most um, 
active states as far as participation in the in the in the colony loss and management survey. We're either number one or number two every single year in the numbers of beekeepers that are participating in the survey. So we're getting very good information, I think very accurate information. But if you see this line uh, that that is occurring um, right about 31%, if I can get my pointer to show up. Let me try something here. Okay, so the, the growth line, if you, or the line here, this dash line here is the average over the past um, 22 years. Um, and that is at 31%. Some years were right on it. Some years were doing good, but most years, um, you know, we're either right at that, that 31% or as, in we, as we saw back in 2018, we're uh, very large losses that are back here. Um, so this is something that, that um, you know, we didn't see 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, most beekeepers back in the, um, back in the uh, 1970s, 1960s, they were expecting five, 10% loss at most. And here we're getting very accustomed to seeing 30% or more loss each year. Um, this is the average loss, or excuse me, this is the total loss of colonies that we see for each of the, um, the past 22 years. Um, if we look at the See if I can get the, there. We go. Um, if we look at the um, the average losses, um, you can see that in some years they're even worse than the with the total losses. So the average loss is what the average loss per beekeeper was. Uh, total is the total numbers for the state, um, but this is what er, you know on average what a beekeeper would expect back in nineteen or or twenty fourteen or uh, twenty fifteen sixteen. Um, and so, you know, these, these numbers are actually even higher than what we see as far as the average losses. So beekeeper to beekeeper, um, you know, we can see that, that those numbers can be a little higher uh, than what we, what we would have expected for, um, uh, for, for most of us, um, or what we would have wanted most of us to do. Some of that <clears throat> has to do with, uh, with pesticides. Uh, we have, um, a number of pesticide or studies that have been uh, undertaken over the past few years. Uh, one of those was undertaken by, uh, with uh, Rick Fell and other researchers out at Virginia Tech a few years ago uh, that, that was sponsored by the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, there's been uh, uh, pesticide sampling that we've been doing as part of the National um, Honeybee Disease Survey. Um, that's something that's been, been um, uh, coordinated with the um, uh, Avery Inspectors of America, USDA, Bee Informed Partnership, and in individual states. And so we're going to be doing that again this year. Uh, we're going to be going around to 24 different apiaries and sampling um, for uh, diseases, sampling for uh, bees uh, to, to test for viruses and uh, nosema for varroa mite content. Uh, we're also going to be uh, selecting uh, five apiaries that we're going to be doing pesticide testing for. Uh, so we'll take pollen out and, and uh, test those in the, in the spring, summer months, uh, usually in the, that uh, May, June period. And then again in the September, October. Um, in addition, uh, we're going to be taking some wax samples this year in the fall from those same uh, apiaries, um, same highs that we sample in the, in the spring and summer for pesticides. Uh, we're going to be taking wax samples and they're going to be, USDA is going to test those for resistance to amitraz and other pesticides um, to see if there's a, um, information that, the, uh, you know, indications there that we're seeing an increase in the, um, in that, that pesticide act or, or uh, activities in the hives. Um, a couple of things that I want to point out with this is that if you look at, at uh, the pesticides that are on here, um, there are a number of, of different pesticides. This is basically the top 10. Um, and you can see that the light blue um, is the amounts that we saw or the concentrations that we saw in the, in the um, uh, Virginia. And then for all samples, that would be across the United States from Maine to Hawaii. Um, and the number one on the list as far as the uh, parts per billion um, of course, is thymol. And if you are not familiar with thymol, that is a uh, miticide that is used by a, a number of beekeepers. It is something that, um, that tends to persist. Um, it is organic, um, natural, if you will, 
Um, but it is something that tends to persist in the hive for a longer period of time than, than, uh, than we would like, than the bees would like. Um, but this is, as I said, this is a top 10. Um, there are over 200 different pesticides and metabolites that have been identified in this study um, that are occurring inside of the hive. Um, some of those, uh, it, like in Nebraska and so forth, we see neonicotinoids. Uh, we do not see those in Virginia. Uh, so some locations, neonicotinoids are a problem. Other locations, as in Virginia, um, the thymol could be a problem. Um, but um, the, 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 uh, the other things that I wanted to point out, this um, uh, 2,4-DMPF, um, that's an amitraz. Um, the uh, acetaminatrid, uh, that's also, um, that's that neonicotinoid um, that I mentioned before. You can see in Virginia, there's practically none detected. Um, where the um, uh, overall samples, we are seeing some detection of it. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to point out is that in this list are insecticides, uh, herbicides, there are insect repellents, miticides, um, but also fungicides. Um, and so the, um, uh, the diuron uh, is an herbicide, the uh, uh, propicose, you know, the, the names that these people come up with. Um, are really fascinating and, and it's kind of, uh, like trying to pronounce Latin. <laughs> but um, we're seeing that uh, this is a fungicide, this is a fungicide. You can see that we are seeing those in Virginia. Um, the, the concern we have with the fungicide is that um, what we're seeing is that while the fungicide itself is not toxic to the bees or to the you know, non-target organisms like the honeybees, um, it does act as a synergist and it causes some of these other um, pesticides that, that may not be toxic to the bees at the levels at which they occur uh, to be synergized and then become more toxic um, to our honeybees. And so that combination of a fungicide with an insecticide can, can cause problems within our hives. And so um, those are things, again, that we're, we're sampling for. We're trying to find out um, uh, you know, what the mechanism is as far as that, that, that synergism um, and see if we can help to protect the bees in that way. Keith? Yes. Is uh, thymol used for anything other than mite treatments for, for not, honeybees? You know, uh, the uh, fluvalinate uh, that, and, and uh, um, other miticides that we use, kumafos, the check mite, um, those we see in other uses, um, other, other pesticide uses, other miticide uses. I'm not aware of any other, you know, use for the thymol. Um, okay. Outside of, outside of our beehives. You know, I, I mean, yes, they, they do, um, you know, it does exist. I'm just not aware of, of other animals that it's being used on, um, that, that, uh, agricultural animals um, that is okay. being used on that would cause that such an increase, such a large amount um, to be found inside of our hive. So, you know, where, where I might say that uh, the avistan, the fluvalinate or the, or the kumafos and check mite, you know, there's other resources. And in fact, we did see, you know, some of the other studies saw uh, in Virginia in particular, uh, one, of our, one of our hives came back or one of our yards came back uh, with a high level of fluvalinate. <clears throat> and and I, I looked at that and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I just came from a beekeeper who does not use pesticide. They're, they're, I mean, just absolutely does not use pesticide. There are no other beekeepers around them. And yet we're seeing that fluvalinate in there. And, and I did a little bit more research and there's, a, there's an orchard um, that was nearby um, that used fluvalinate um, to control some of the mites that were getting into the orchard. So there, there are other uses for these pesticides. Um, but thymol, like I said, I'm just not aware of, of it being used it, it, by other uh, re, for, or for other reasons um, it, it, in, in, in the numbers that would justify this, this uh, parts per billion that we're seeing inside of the, uh, the samples that we found. Understood. Yeah. Two part question on amitraz. I, don't they use that for cattle ticks or something? Something yes. like that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, when it was first used, uh, the Mitocure, um, there was a, uh, a, a counter collar uh, that was uh, being produced. It was a roll of, of the same uh, formulation that, that um, uh, you know, you, you basically stapled together around a cow's neck. 
And so beekeepers were going out, particularly the commercial guys were going out and buying that roll of Amitraz or the Mitocure, um, clipping off about six inches of it and hanging it in their hives. And so um, what we what happened with that was that once they did get the Midas, the Amitraz approved for use for inside of the beehive, the commercial industry found that they had total resistance to it. Um, you know, we see, we see that with other products as well as that, that, you know, that, that pre-use of it um, it basically nullifies a lot of the usage that we can have out of it in in the future. Um, And so, you know, I I know there are, there are some companies out there that say that their miticides are, you know, there's never going to be any resistance to it. um, But we thought the same thing of teramycin um, until we started seeing resistance to it because the formulation that was being used back in the 1990s, gave us that extended exposure inside of the hive. And so, yeah, we, you know, as long as we're doing it quick, as long as we're rotating, as long as we're using it only when we need it, yeah, we're not going to see resistance. But if you use it all the time and it's the only thing you use, every product out there is going to have some resistance at some point. Seemed like there were a lot of um, unofficial reports of resistance to Amitraz last year for the first time in beehives. Is that, yeah, did you, yeah. Did that, you see that's that? That's something that, that we and other states are investigating. Um, like I said, we're including it into the, uh, the, the National um, Bee Disease and Pest Survey um, so that we can try to get a better handle on what, what actually is occurring. Um, it, it, you know, g- going back to my past history, 2000, when I came on, um, you know, we were just starting to use Checkmite, the Kumafos. Um, and the reason was that it was, you know, everybody was saying that, that the fluvanilate, the apostane didn't work. The fluvanilate had resistance to it. Um, I called this, you know, I, I knew the state apris up in, in Maryland very well. And, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to him and said, you know, we got to get to section 18. I'm just not seeing a need for it. What are you seeing out there? He said, oh, we've got hundred percent resistance to fluvanilate. I said, a hundred percent? He said, wow. yeah, we, we, you know, we cannot use it. It does not work, period. I said, huh. I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> so, so, you know, we went ahead with the Section 18 on the basis of the resistance. But at the same time, I was starting a survey of our beehives as it was going out to do an inspections and testing for resistance. Very few of our hives showed resistance. Um, the, or the mites inside of those hives showed resistance. Where we saw resistance was with the new packages coming in. So it was the new bees that were coming in that were being exposed to that fluvanilate. Four or five years down the road of not using it or not being exposed to it, um, you know, those hives were, were not showing any resistance or, or you know, we were still, still getting good control with the fluvanilate with it. So again, we're gonna see resistance if it's the only thing that you use and you use it repeatedly. So you just need to use it judiciously um, and you need to use it appropriately. You know, f- again, follow the label, follow the follow the need. Um, so be sure to sample um, hives before you before you th- start throwing pesticide in there. And that, that includes the oxalic acid. Uh, make sure that you have a problem before you start subjecting the bees to these pesticides because it does have a toxic and a non toxic effect on them. Um, it can have detrimental effects even if it doesn't kill them. Right. Um- Joan asked if there would be resistance to thymol or formic acid, and I guess you kind of answered that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know that I know that it's advertised that it's that it won't. Um, but again, I, I just it, if it's used appropriately, if it's used judiciously, no. Um, but um, unfortunately, we don't always see that. Okay, so. We need to mix up the treatments. We need to not do 100% of one thing in one year, I guess, right? Well, it, I mean, one year, um, it, it's, it, I'm not going to go to that extreme. Um, if, you've, if you've got a product that's still good, still using um, for one year, that, that's fine. If you're repeating it, um, if you're repeating it three, four, five times, then there's a problem. Um, yeah. But if you're only repeating it once or twice, you know, then that's, you're probably still getting good control of it. The next year you should be switching over to something else for sure. Um, don't, yeah. Like I said, don't use the same thing repeatedly year after year after year, or time after time after time. So, um, yeah. But, <clears throat> sure, go uh, ahead. 
with regard to the pesticide, I just wanted to conclude with this since we've got the, um, you know, the, the pollinator protection plan and the uh, bee check program and so forth. What you can do as far as advising uh, applicators around you as well as in your own beehive. Um, you know, with regard to a lot of the sprays, a lot of the pesticides that are being put, in, put out there, um, you know, we look at not just the toxicity depends on, uh, on what the, uh, what, you know, what the level of the, of the concentration is, so concentration, but also the exposure to that, how much exposure they have. So in the case of our honeybees and most of our pollinators, um, most of their foraging occurs in the morning. Uh, much of the afternoon, uh, particularly in the summer into the fall, um, it's, it's a hot, dry environment. Even though humidity may be up, it's still dry as far as the soil is concerned. And so many of those flowers are going to be, if not closing up, are drying up. And so we don't see as much foraging on plants uh, in the afternoon and, in, and definitely into the evening. So the, the later in the day that that application can occur with regard to, again, controlling pests outside of the hive, um, then that, that's more beneficial as far as limiting the exposure uh, and minimizing the risk of that pesticide. Uh, product formulation, you know, aerosol versus, versus a dust versus a, uh, you know, ground drench versus all these other different formulations out there, they all matter. Um, dust, very, very common uh, problem with that is that it mimics pollen. Uh, and so your bees are designed to pick up pollen and they're going to be picking up that dust and carrying it back. So, um, you know, what type of formulation it is um, also also matters. And of course, that formulation also plays into the drift. Um, if you're doing a, uh, you know, above ground or, or aerial application, you're going to be having some drift. The higher up it's applied, the further the drift, uh, the more wind it is. You know, even if you think it's a calm day, um, things can be carried, particularly if it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a smaller particle size, it can be carried for a, a, a great distance, you know, not just a few feet, but sometimes even miles. Um, many of our, uh, you know, nighttime uh, mosquito applications, aerial uh, mosquito populations are, are uh, designed to be carried uh, as a mist over a great area. Um, and so, you know, you may have an application that's going on, you know, several miles away from you, but if the, you know, if the right conditions occur, that, 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 that drift, that mist may make its way over into your hives. And of course, if it's a warm night, your bees are trying to ventilate, they may be, you know, sucking in that, that, uh, that pesticide with it. So be aware of what's going on, uh, the potential drift of pesticides that can be, can be occurring. Observation, what's going on, you know, how are your bees reacting? Are you seeing... Uh, sluggishness? Are you seeing, um, you know, things that are that would indicate to you that there could be a problem as far as the not just the pesticide, but also the health of the bees, um, because that's that the health situation also works in that their resistance to that pesticide. Uh, you know, I mentioned about the mites being resistant to it. Their honeybees could be resistant to things as well. We are resistant to things, um, and so. Um, you know, the healthier we are, uh, the, the, you know, better the nutrients we get and, and everything, uh, everything uh, works against um, that toxicity of it. And so we want to make sure that the bees are, are healthy um, and not being stressed out by other factors. And then if you do see a bee kill, uh, if you do have concerns that you might have lost some bees to a pesticide, notify our Office of Pesticide Services. Um, they, can, they can start an investigation and find out um, if something did occur, um, they may not be able to get you restitution in their fines and so forth, but it will give you um, something that you can take to the um, to that applicator and say, okay, obviously you 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 created a problem um, from this report. It says that you you know you misuse you 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 know you, you use it off label whatever it was. Um, if it was a violation, that is something that you can use as far as um, uh, getting uh, restitution from the applicator. So I'll stop there, uh, open it up for discussion. Uh, if anybody has any questions, let me stop sharing here um, and see if, see if you're still awake. <sighs> okay, I've got one for you. Do we know anything about Roundup and how it affects honeybees or other insects? Um, it, that's been a question that's come up for a number of years. Um, the, the herbicide, Roundup as an herbicide, 
Understood. Um, the, the mode of action is not something that should be of concern to the two animals. Um, and so it's just, a, it's just a different, um, mechanism that it uses in order to, um, to interrupt with the, with the growth of, of the plant, um, functions. So in that regard, the actual active ingredient, no, um, the problem that has been, been occurring is that there's a number of different formulations and in those formulations, there's a number of curing agents and other, um, non-active ingredient inclusions in there, um, either to keep it, uh, you know, well mixed or to keep it, um, you know, from breaking down too rapidly, all kinds of different things. I, what we're seeing is that it's those carrying agents as those other ingredients um, that can have a can have an impact. Um, and so you don't want to have any um, direct exposure um, to your bees. Um, but I think if they come in, it, typically they're not going to be coming in contact with um, uh, flowering plants that have been exposed to the, to the Roundup. Um, so again, be careful with it around, your, around the hive itself. Um, but I think for the, in general, um, it's not going to have uh, an impact on them for, for somebody that's using it, you know, a, a couple of blocks away or, or um, uh, using it in the, in the, you know, in the farm that's, that's down the street. Right. Yes, yeah, uh, so many of the commercial farmers are using um, resist, resistant soybeans and corn, yes. so they can just spray the spray the heck out of it, it with Roundup. That gets into that biotechnology that I mentioned before that's uh, causing the decline. Is that we're seeing that um, a, a cha genetic change in the plants. Um, and so sometimes the nutritional value or some of the factors that are helping those plants to grow um, it may be detrimental to the bee. So um, if, if you're around a GMO, you might want to, uh, you know, when, when they are flowering, uh, you know, check it out to see what exactly is, um, what, what factors they have in there that, that help that plant um, that could be detrimental to your bees. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Oops. Why are neonics not a problem <laughs> in Virginia? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I think for one, it's it's just the level of usage um, in Nebraska and other. I mean, you, you've got a monoculture, you've got a um, more or less a monoculture. You've got uh, heavy uses of the neonicotinoids. Um, yes, we see them used in, in Virginia. Uh, but typically they're not being, uh, it's not being an aerial spray. It's not being a, you know, a, a you know, boom spray um, to put it out there. Um, it's something that, that uh, you know, it's, it's a, a soil uh, treatment or a seed treatment. And, and what gets picked up is, is, and makes it up into the flower, into the, into the nectar um, is, is a lot less concentration um, than what we see. Um, you know, Rick Fell, like I said, he did a, uh, they were doing a study on that um, a few years ago. Uh, their conclusion, they couldn't find neonicotinoids in the, in the samples that they, with the, that they took. Um, in, uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp up at the, up in Maryland, um, you know, a few years ago said the same thing. He said, said, you know, we're, we're feeding neonicotinoids directly to the bees and we can't find it in the hive after we feed it to them. Um, you, you know, that's a, uh, that's my interpretation of what he said, but, but basically um, we're, I, I think it's, I think it's the fact that we are not seeing as much exposure um, in Virginia as we do in some of the other states, the, the two states that stand out as being relatively concerned as far as the neonicotinoids, uh, number one on the list was Nebraska, the other was Florida. Hmm. Are they used only on specific crops or, or are they widespread? No, it's, um, it, it's since the 1970s, it's probably becoming one of the more popular, uh, you know, usage um, as far as controlling of the pest. But again, most of their, most of the usage is like for landowners or homeowners, excuse me. Um, and so oh. you're seeing it in small amounts that are going in um, yeah. in any one place. And then, and then, you know, you might put something down and your neighbor might put something down next week. And by then what you put down is, has broken down. Um, so like I said, I think the exposure 
um, is is just lower here in Virginia than in other states. Hmm. That's great. That's the most encouraging thing I heard all night. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's still going to make the news. It's still going to be, you know, something that, uh, again, General Assembly took it up, uh, uh, I think it was last year. Um, they were looking to, um, for, for help, or I shouldn't say help. They were looking for, um, you know, ways of minimizing the impact of neonicotinoids on our, on our pollinators. And, uh, you know, we, I kind of looked at it and said, you know, that's a great effort, but I, I, I don't know that that's where our losses are. Um, you know, we see we see losses from so many other places, uh, and of course, number one on the list is the varroa mite and the in the viruses and other you know fa factors that they carry with them and in and, uh, and infect their bees with. Okay, anybody else? I was wondering if you have information updates on when. Mike, could, did you get the rest of that? I only saw the win. I'm not, I'm not seeing that at all. Is that, Let me see. I huh. uh, was wondering if you have information updates on when folks who were selected to receive hives to the Virginia uh, might receive them. Um, most of them have been distributed. In fact, I was given a report to our, uh, our division director today. We've, we've distributed... Um, uh, we have equipment out to uh, 779 people um, next week. Uh, hopefully another 13 people will get theirs. Um, we're, we're at kind of a standstill right now um, because the supplier, which is uh, Dedant, um, has, is running short of some of the equipment. Um, and, and some of you may have, may have um, experienced that, calling them up and trying to order something that certain items are not available. Um, so their supplier of the wedge top bars, uh, the masonite um, is, is getting a little short. So we're waiting for them to get a new, uh, new shipment of those supplies in that we can get that last group of people um, get, that, get that out. So we've got about, um, about 100 more people um, that we need to get the, the equipment out to. Um, and then that'll, that'll basically spend all the money for this year. Um, the, the budget... Um, for uh, the next fiscal year, um, the, I should say the, the proposed budget for the next fiscal year does include funding for the BHAB distribution program. So we're likely to continue uh, the program next, next July. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is that about five minutes after the legislators showed up in Richmond today, um, they adjourned because they have no agreement on the budget. So we're still, you know, at looking to see what what's going to be funded what's not going to be funded next year um this another question has there been a an increase in nosema yes <laughs> uh well i shouldn't say there's an increase it is a concern um, we have been seeing high levels of it and and we've seen uh, a large distribution of it um uh, earlier today, I, I ran a sample. I, I found 45 million spores per bee in the sample. Um, where, if those of you that know, one million spores per bee is the is the the threshold for uh, action threshold, if you will, for for treatment. Um, it, it is something that you know that I've been talking to beekeepers about for a number of years. That we are seeing a persistence in the SEMA. Um, and so I think that, that it's, it's the silent disease. You can't tell from the outside that the bees have it until they just dwindle away to nothing. And so a lot of our summer losses and, and the, the survey, if you've paid attention the past few years, um, the survey is, is, uh, is showing that our summer losses are actually exceeding our winter losses in the past few, few years. And one of the contributing factors is nosema. Is there anything that can be done prophylactically to uh, curtail the semen? Um, the, uh, of course, the, the, we do now have treatment. The fumagillin is, is back on the market. Um, it's from a different source. Um, you know, it's not the European source. We're getting it from Asia now. Um, I, I think at, at this, the best thing that the beekeepers could do is just, um, you know, try to 
maximize the nutrition that you, that your bees get. And by that, I mean, that, you know, just the, the variety of pollens that come in, the variety of nectars that come in, uh, making sure that they're not stressed out in the summertime. Um, you know, once we get into July, there's not going to be a whole lot out there for them. Uh, you know, we, we've got about uh, a six to eight week period in that May through June, 1st of July um, to make our honey or to, for our bees to make their honey. After that, the, you know, the resources start to do a little way to nothing. You know, there's plenty of plants out there. It's just not very much nectar, uh, not very much pollen. And so anything that you can uh, do to help promote that, um, you know, not taking off too much nectar, uh, honey, um, you know, as you, as you go into the summer, um, not leaving on too much um, so that they have too much space that they need to protect. A small high beetle might, might become a problem. Um, those are, th are factors. Um, just maintaining the health of the bees is the best thing that you can do. Okay. Um, let's see, one more question. Two more, actually. Local garden center sells a mosquito shield that may be harmful to bees. What can we do to advocate for better responsibility? Uh, mosquito shield. I'm assuming that that's a spray. I think <laughs> so. Okay. I think so. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, we, as a group, um, you guys have a number of educational programs, outreach programs that are going on. The mm -hmm. more you communicate with, to the public, how your bees are just as susceptible to the insecticides as the target organism is, um, you know, to point out to people who said that, you know, the, particularly the insecticides, but other pesticides as well, are not specific to a target organism. You know, you might, you might want to put something out for the mosquitoes. You might want to put something out for the Japanese beetles, but other insects are going to be just as susceptible to it. Maybe more or less as they, as it is, but they will be impacted either in a, in a lethal or sublethal way. Um, so I think your, your educational programs, outreach, you know, um, communicating with the, um, with the with the public as to the responsible use of those pesticides just like i was talking about with responsible use of our miticides um that that'll go a long way as far as the um, helping um before we go any further um i i just want to point out see elizabeth cromer is is, is has has been listening in and i appreciate her, her doing that elizabeth has rejoined our uh, staff again this year uh, we've we've um uh, had some staffing changes. Uh, and Elizabeth is coming in again to, um, to handle our northern Shenandoah Valley area as far as the apiary inspection. And she'll be helping me out with the, uh, with the, with the National Survey, uh, Pest and Disease Survey, and also with the, um, the again, uh, provided we have the funding, uh, the BHAB distribution program. So I just wanted to, you know, let you know that if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to her because she loves to be, to talk bees. <laughs> She was here today. Good. <laughs> um, one other question about fumagillin, and, and um, is it it's only relevant to Nosemus apis and not Nosemus serena? It it is. Um, it it has shown to be more effective, um, uh, better efficacy, if you will, with the Nosema <clears throat> apis than with the Nosema serrana. The Nosema serrana seems to have a a, a more um, more re, uh, resilience against the fumagillin, but um, it, it can provide you with some suppression of the disease as well as control in some instances. And, and should that be used as a preventative or, well, I guess you don't I, really know until no, it's too I, late, right? Yeah, I, I don't recommend any, any preventive medicine. You know, we, we um, I, I came along when, when teramycin was, you know, you got a package, you treat them with teramycin, you um, came out of winter, you treat them with teramycin, you're, you know, you're going into the, into the, into, into the winter, you're treating them with teramycin and fumagillin. Um, I, I think we have gotten past that. Um, I think people are realizing that, you know, that, that continuous over treatment um, not only leads to the resistance, you know, that we mentioned before, right. but also yeah. to contamination. Um, of our of our honeys and their in uh, in, in other food products that we have out there, and some of those fumagillin is not one of them, but termycin is 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 an, 
um, is important to us as an antibiotic. And so we want to be careful when we're when we're using it. Again, judicious use is is the it is the terminology that's going on today, and I think that that's what we should be following. Um, Nosema can be identified. I don't, I don't know if, um, if you have the capability in your group, but if there's a volunteer or two um, that has uh, the microscopic expertise and equipment, um, they certainly can be um, sampled. It's, it's about, um, roughly takes about 10 minutes um, to do it, to do it, to sample, uh, and, and, uh, and look under a microscope in order to identify the spores of the nosema that um, uh, would let you know if there's a problem or not. Good to know. That's something we'll have to work on within the group. All right, let's, we're, we've got you on overtime now, so I think we're gonna, yeah. <laughs> we're, 